rise of Robert Hills. Division one is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. We are on the record in CV 200393. This is Prescott v. Prescott. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, please remember that these proceedings are being video and audio recorded and live streamed. So we ask counsel to please identify yourself and your client at the beginning of your argument. Each side will have 20 minutes. Appellant's counsel is responsible for watching the clock to reserve a portion for rebuttal if you desire. Also, please keep in mind that we've read the briefs and have conferenced the case this morning. And with that, counsel, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court, Al Arpad on behalf of Rose Prescott, the appellant, and with me is Joe Romley, trial counsel uh, and co-counsel on appeal. Um, I would like to reserve two or three minutes at the end if I could. Um, in reviewing the briefs, um, we briefed this case pretty extensively, uh, and so I may not even use all my time unless you have a lot of questions for me. Uh, we have gave you a lot of background on due process, um, on various motion standards as analogies, even though this was resolved on a sort of a nonspecific post-trial motion. Uh, we did that because it seems like these cases are coming up a lot. There are a lot of uh, unpublished decisions, a few published decisions on point. Uh, and we're hoping that this court will actually publish something to give a little more guidance, because it does seem like these decisions, um, it, it, both the trial courts and, I think, trial counsel need help with this. Counsel, give me a a little guidepost is what exactly you think is so novel and new that requires publication. Uh, I'll get right to the heart of it. I think you should say that the, the, the trial judges should uh, refer to Rule 79F. If they're going to grant a summary disposition uh, that's case dispositive, they should give somebody some warning under, under Family Law Rule 79F and say, I'm considering disposing of this case without a hearing. You need to convince me that there's a reason for a hearing here. And that would probably head off a lot of these cases. Even if it didn't head off these cases, you'd have a clear summary judgment standard to decide them on instead of sort of the Hootke standard, uh, which is case by case, ad hoc. We'll know it when we see it if there's enough, but it's not really evidence. It's sort of evidence. It's things that were filed with pleadings. I think that's a difficult standard, and I think that's what's generating a lot of the caseload on this. Does that answer your question, Your Honor? Sort of, but doesn't Rule 79F already say that? Rule 7, well, uh, very interesting. Um, the, in the Cooper case, there's a footnote, a recent, very recent unpublished case, that says uh, trial counsel argued about uh, whether there were facts under a summary judgment standard and referred to summary judgment. This wasn't a summary judgment case because no summary judgment motion was filed. I think we have to read, if we read Rule 79 the way I think it was written, to be read by non-lawyers as well as lawyers, most lawyers would say that this was a judgment granted summarily. That sounds like a summary judgment. Uh, all of us who went to law school spent a lot of time arguing in civil procedure about Rule 56. Uh, think of summary judgment as being much more specific than that. But I think the, the, the application of Rule 79F, if, if we had an opinion saying, you know, if you're going to grant judgment summarily without a hearing, it would be a really good idea to give notice under 79F that that's coming up. Because that didn't happen in this case. There was no notice of any kind. The, the, there's been argument from the other side that, um, uh, that, they're, uh, that, that we were required to demonstrate an issue of fact and introduce evidence with our motion and so forth. There's no notice of that. My, my uh, co-counsel here pointed out what the issues were. I think they're obvious enough to survive even if you did try to apply a summary judgment standard. There obviously are issues of fact here because there's a, the one hard number we have on valuation of the property is a big number. Uh, and it's, my client got way less than half of it. That's a big, important issue of fact. Uh, but we'd be in a lot clearer situation if judges just routinely said, I'm thinking about granting judgment without a hearing. You need to tell me why I can't do that. I understand your argument. I think there's, there's a lot of merit to it. But it, it, isn't it this a different kettle of fish than a summary judgment proceeding? This, it seems much more analogous to me, like a settlement proceeding. And if you know, if a parties file a notice of settlement in regular civil litigation, entering that notice is not granting summary judgment, or, accept, or a court accepting that notice and entering judgment in the case is not a summary judgment. And this 
I'm not saying that this is exactly like that because there is the fairness standard which the court is supposed to determine, et cetera. But how, how, how strongly do you feel about that analogy to summary judgment in this situation? I feel in this situation, well, I, that was something I wanted to clarify because I, I think I said at one point in one of the briefs, uh, summary judgment is not a good fit here. And I wanted to be clear, it's not a good fit on this record because we didn't follow the summary judgment process. Nobody filed a motion for summary judgment. The judge did not give a 79F type of a warning. And so therefore, there's not a statement of facts and there's not declarations and there's not that type of thing in the record. So as applied to this case, it's in a sense a poor analogy. But I think it's a very good analogy for a good, efficient way to handle this so that both trial courts and practitioners and this court know what to do with the record when they get it. OK, I'm considering entering judgment. And, and I think you're exactly right that this is different from civil litigation. The, the two rules are, are written quite differently, 56 and 79. Uh, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that, one of which is that so many of the family law um, uh, parties are unrepresented. They need to be able to read the rule and kind of understand what the deal is. Uh, but under the family law rules and under uh, ARS 25317B, there is this substantial, substantive issue that has to be dealt with after a settlement agreement, which largely doesn't exist in the civil world. The standards in the civil world are much more cursory. And a, a judge can get away with saying, you went to a mediation, you were represented by counsel. I'm not getting into the, the, the merits of your deal as long as it meets the, the standards of a contract. I'm not going to overturn your deal unless it's really, really amazingly unfair. There's a different standard here, and it is very much akin to granting judgment, because it's the sort of thing that ought to have a hearing if there are disputed facts. How would this have gone differently had you received notice? Uh, well, my co-counsel uh, submitted a motion that didn't have a lot of things stapled to it. And again, if you go over some of the recent unpublished decisions, um, I think it may have even been in the Jones decision, uh, where the, the party, the, the appellee, was arguing, well, there might not have been much in the record, but the, uh, the appellant, the person who was moving, submitted some documents with their motion. And so therefore, you should look at those. And that's the record. And that's enough of a record to uphold the judgment. You disagreed with that. I agree with you on that. But uh, he, he essentially treated it as a pleading standard. He, he simply pointed out, OK, there are this, this, and this uh, uh, that are disputed. And those are big, important issues. And therefore, you need to hold a hearing on it. He didn't attach a lot of documents. He didn't do other things like that. And that's why we said that this is actually more like a pleading standard type of a motion. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of the basic facts weren't contested. So there's not really a question. Nobody is saying that there wasn't a Kotzen valuation report and that the numbers in the Kotzen valuation report weren't 3.4 million and 4 million. The disagreement is, was there some basis then at this mediation to give a very substantial discount in the value? Or was there some reason why one side, the husband, should get a much more valuable piece of those companies and, the other, and, and wife should get a certain amount of cash that is much less when you call it a number? That's just the type of issue that really has to go to a hearing. Did I answer your question? Because I think I digressed a little bit. Okay. You did. Thank you. Um, so the fact that I did so much briefing, the, the core point I wanted to make, the fact that we did so much briefing on this, I don't want you to take that as meaning that we think it's a hard case. I don't think it's a hard case. The trial judge said uh, this was arrived at through a fair procedure. And I uh, think all these fairness arguments are just buyer's remorse, and I'm not going to consider them. That by itself, I think, is enough that you have to send it back and say, no, we, we really need a, a fairness finding. So if we accept that premise, what do we send it back for? A fairness finding on only the issues you raised? Send the entire agreement back for a fairness finding? How would you handle that procedurally? One of the fascinating things about this case is that the record is not even complete enough to predict the party's trial strategy. Uh, one of the things that struck me is that nobody's even talked about valuation date yet. In cases like this where you have a family business, a lot of times it's very important whether you're going to value at the date of the petition filing, the date of the dissolution, maybe even a later date because things have happened with the business that have drastically changed the circumstances. I think in an abundance of caution, you probably need to send it back for 
a fairness finding on the entire uh, on the entire settlement agreement because the whole settlement agreement settles together hangs together that said most of the other terms that we didn't talk about on appeal are largely fifty fifty so i doubt those are going to be big subjects of, of controversy on remand i think i think on remand the issues that are going to be litigated are the same issues uh, that we've talked about those the three issues the division of the companies whether there's spousal maintenance in light of the financial circumstances of the party once you take into account the division of the of the marital assets and then the tax issues let's talk about the tax issues i think most of those have been executed. She signed off on the tax returns. Is that correct? There is a, a ton of paperwork, probably more post-trial uh, paperwork, post-dissolution paperwork in that file right now than, than there was pre-dissolution. Uh, and a lot of it does have to do with the taxes. There have been some decisions issued. Those decisions may be coming up here in the future, although we'll probably ask for a stay if this court hasn't decided this issue, because it would be pointless to decide those if you're going to then go back and change the, the foundation of it. Um, but the answer is largely yes, the taxes have been filed. Um, there, there are still payment issues. There's an order that was just entered yesterday, I think, saying I'm not going to reconsider the orders that I made about who has to pay what. Interestingly enough, what we talked about a lot in the briefing with the tax issues is, oh, this is unfair to make her sign off on something that she has in no, no confidence in. Uh, as it's played out, the actual payment provisions are what really seems unfair because there was lots of income going in. Husband got all the income and wife is paying taxes on income she didn't get. So that issue looms a little larger if you if you send it back. Thank you. Council, um, as to the agreement itself, there's no severability severability clause in the agreement, is there? I think that's true, but the judge has to find the overall agreement fair. So if you say these these various things are going to remain fixed because nobody challenged them on appeal. That's feasible. Again, they're mostly 50 50, um, but the agreement overall has to be fair. Council, I don't think you either answered or heard his question. It, does the agreement contain a severability clause? I don't believe so. Okay. So that, that would tend to support that, yes. Um, I don't know that I have a lot else for you if you don't have questions for me. The one other case I'll mention is the Chalmers case. And again, that was something that triggered me to write as much as I did about theoretically analogous standards and so forth, is because it seemed to me the Chalmers case had come out not that long before. And that panel seemed to be kind of going in the wrong direction. There is some language in there about how it was uh, the I think it was the husband's burden in that case to show a factual issue as if there had been a summary judgment uh, motion filed. And in fact, I don't think there was a summary judgment motion filed. Now, it's a weird case. The husband's being placed under a conservatorship at the same time that he's going through the divorce. There are all kinds of strange things about it. Um, but that was one of the things that made me a little nervous. And it certainly is what the husband has argued, is that my client had a burden to actually file something like a statement of facts or lots of information or whatever to support, the, uh, uh, to, to support her motion. And if that's true, then again, this court should publish that and say so, because it's not at all clear to me from reading the case law. It's not clear in the rules. It's not clear in the statute. It's not clear anywhere. It is clear that my client has the burden at the hearing of ultimately showing uh, that the agreement is unfair and should be, uh, uh, should be either modified or reversed. But it is not true that, it, that anything gives anybody warning that they face a summary judgment type standard if they don't make that initial burden of production producing actual evidence with their motion. So the fallback position should always be if somebody requests a hearing on fairness, they should get a hearing. Yes. And, I, and again, I think a simple, a relatively simple fix without having, to, um, without having to rewrite the family law rules and appoint yet another committee on that uh, is that you can just remind judges that 79F exists. And if they're thinking of not doing that, they should give them a chance say, look, I'm really thinking there's not much of an issue here. Why don't you convince me otherwise? You, you have until such and such date to file something that convinces me that there's actually an issue for a hearing. That's a relatively realistic, straightforward solution to that problem, which then puts us in territory where we know what the burden is and we know how to evaluate it when we get up here on appeal. 
My hesitation is because the, well, and I want to make sure you have whatever time you want to reserve, but the statute already says the court shall, upon motion of the parties, consider the evidence. And doesn't that imply that the party opposing settlement in this case, kind of going back to the original question I had about is this more akin to a settlement agreement in a civil litigation, the burden is on them to present some evidence to the court. And why does the court have to say, hey, you haven't presented me any evidence? If that is the standard without going in that direction, then I think you need to announce that. Because if you look at the history of the cases, Sharp was, in fact, a summary judgment case. And I commend them. They filed a summary judgment motion and made things clear for all of us as to how we should evaluate it. That's not going to happen all the time in family law, particularly with self-represented litigants. It would help a lot if the judges would give people notice on that. If the judges don't give notice, my client certainly did not have notice that she needed to prove her case in the motion. The statute says evidence. The assumption I would make as a litigator is that I'm going to get an opportunity to present evidence, not that I should staple a bunch of things to my motion that the trial court is going to try to interpret on an ad hoc basis, even though they haven't been admitted as evidence. I don't think that's the way to go. And I think the majority of the cases have correctly seen that recently. I'll reserve the rest of my time, if I may. Thank you, counsel. You have about four minutes and 20 seconds left. Ms. Ward. Good morning, Your Honors. Emily Ward of Fenimore Craig on behalf of Robert Prescott. I'm glad that the panel asked Mr. Arpad several of these questions, because I think that this highlights exactly what's the problem here. There was no evidence attached to her motion. Wife has argued that, well, I needed to know that I needed to submit evidence. But Rule 69C already tells her that. In fact, it says she has the burden to establish this, to establish that the agreement is unfair. What was that? When does she have that burden? She has that burden at the initial motion. I actually was charting out. Rule 69C doesn't say she has that burden in the motion, as opposed to just the burden overall. Sure. So think about it this way. I actually was charting this out as you guys were speaking earlier. You file a motion. You attach your evidence, right? If there is no evidence attached, then the court, the family court, can only look at the agreement itself, right, to determine the fundamental fairness. And if under Hutkey it doesn't have the ability to do that, then may need to hold an evidentiary hearing, may need to reject it, et cetera. If you do attach evidence. Let's wait. Let's stop there. Okay. So all the court had was this agreement. Where in this agreement is the court able to evaluate the value ascribed to each of the assets? Because it's not in the agreement. Absolutely, Your Honor. The issue that we are deciding here today is the company valuation. And the wife affirmed in her motion, and that motion itself is sufficient. She didn't need to attach evidence because it's her own statement of what the parties agreed to at the mediation, right? She is not saying, I deem that the companies are valued at this. It's this is what we agreed to at the mediation is that they were valued at $2 million. And so that is sufficient. And so the court can look at that motion. But she also says, but I think that valuation was wrong, that it was less than the mediation or than the valuation determined by the neutral arbiter. Right. But the court is evaluating. Think about the threshold inquiry. So Bill and Melinda Gates got divorced, and they're getting divorced right now. And they submitted a Rule 69 agreement, and Melinda Gates is getting $1 million. And she, in her motion, says, during the arbitration, we agreed it was worth $2 million. But everybody in the world knows this is a $60 billion company. The court just has to ignore that? But she needed to submit evidence. I mean, I suppose if everyone in the world did know, maybe that's different. But she needed to submit evidence that the $60 million number is wrong. Let me tell you why. Where is her authority for her having to submit the evidence in the motion? Because she has the initial burden. Unless that burden is the court needs to look at. Read me or cite me something that says it has to be in the motion. It doesn't say in the motion. It's never going to say in the motion. And the reason for that is because. And in plenty of cases where we have burdens being established, it's after a hearing or after trial. 
Not necessarily. No, not in a civil context. If you don't submit evidence um, with your, you know, your response to a summary judgment, the court isn't because going the rule to hold. Specifically you know. provides that you have to attach that to your summary judgment motion. But if you have the burden, how can you? We have a rule that doesn't say that, right? What, what was that? We have a rule that doesn't say you have to specifically attach it to your motion contesting a. Uh, a, a settlement agreement under Rule 69. That is true, but that being said, Hutke says that an evidentiary hearing is not required, right? We all agree that that, that, that is not per se always required in every single situation. I, I Let's say that she was supposed to say, without citing, relying on the COTS valuation. Let's say she thinks, I think that the companies are worth $100 million. What What evidence does she have to create that that is anything other than pure conjecture? The court needs to base that in reality, and that's why. Your client could file a response and saying, "No, she's wrong," and if if and that your client didn't even do that in this case, didn't didn't take any issue with and its response with the valuation she asserted based upon the independent evaluator. The client did. Uh, so uh, my the client did not. Looking at a motion now that says the, the the things worth, and I'm making up the numbers. I don't remember what they were. Four point five million, right? And your client responds and says, "No, she stuck with her agreement." but doesn't dispute the 4.5 million. Why can't the court accept that now as, as the valuation? Specifically because the, my client did not dispute that the COTS in valuation was right, wrong, or otherwise. My client was focused on, we agreed on 2 million. And so that's a subjective valuation that was um, both both parties agreed to initially. And if, you know, based on Hutke- So going back to my Microsoft example, if Melinda Gates set, or files her motion and says, we agreed this was worth, the Microsoft was worth $2 million. Is the court bound by that agreement if, if there's other evidence or at least the assertion of other evidence that would say that it's worth $60 billion? That's the difference. The distinguishing factor there is, is there evidence versus, well, I, I would, I would submit. Well, she in her motion, there is other evidence. She asserted in her she motion did. that there was this independent valuation that put it at $5 million. And I don't, I, I'm just losing where we're supposed to tell the trial court's it's okay to ignore that assertion unless she attaches it to the thing because I don't see anything in the rules as opposed to the summary judgment rules which require you to attach these things says it has to be attached in the initial motion. Well, I do believe that, I, I believe it was you or, or Judge Williams said that um, 25317B does speak in terms of evidence and it is it, evaluating. It says, unless it finds after considering the economic circumstances of the parties and other relevant evidence produced by the parties. But my question is when? It doesn't say other relevant evidence produced by the parties in their motion saying, I don't want this settlement agreement. It just says produced by the parties, which would, to me, a logical reading, that would be at a hearing. But a hearing is not triggered unless, in fact, there is a disputed issue, right? We, that's what Hucky says. Right. So, it, 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 or, or alternatively, if the court cannot make that, you know, if there isn't evidence in the I'm record trying. to justify the fairness. And I'm, I'm sorry I'm being so, this is a really interesting issue to me, so I, I, maybe that, I'm diving in or gnawing too, too hard on this bone, but do you agree that the, whatever the parties agreed to in the, as the valuation of the company, is that binding on the court? Unless there is evidence to dispute that to dispute the fairness of that. For example, if, if the parties agreed that, you know, um, you know, a Tesla is worth a dollar or something, right? I think that the court can, if you submit, if, if you were to, well, that's maybe a bad example because that's patently obvious, I suppose, but you would need to submit evidence to challenge that that, that determination was not made fairly. In Hutkey, uh, paragraph 31. And your the, position is they have to submit all of that evidence in their initial motion to create, to to establish that, to initially sustain that burden. And, th and the reason why is you cannot just fall back on, oh, well, I'm going to get an evidentiary hearing, right? Because it's totally possible, by the way. Think about it this way. But if, let's say if you, well, had, if you had responded to the to the motion and said, no, there is no dispute as to valuation, we agreed $2 million, and her, there was no independent evaluator report that put it at higher. Then an evidentiary hearing is required. Okay. Because it's but disputed. Here you, then you said uh, we're not touching the 4.5 million. We're just saying it's the initial valuation. It seems like that puts a factual issue there to the court. There's no dispute. That there's this other valuation that the court needs to now consider. But the the valuation itself was never submitted to the court. So and under Hutkey, an evidentiary hearing is not required 
right? And so the court can, can I, I suppose, consider that, which it's, it's possible here that it, the court did. You know, it, it, at the end of the day, the court could have considered, he, he didn't necessarily specify, that the, you know, that the valuation that the parties agreed to was fair. And in fact, in Huckey, paragraph 31, the, the, this court cites almost an, an identical situation where there's a subjective valuation, the parties had to, you know, do some horse trading, if you will, right? Because it's not set in stone what it is. Um, and so, you know, the court, the family court there said, the wife's allegation that she believes husband withdrew money to deliberately overpay taxes is supported by no facts and no documents. And then this court said, um, Unlike in Sharp, we cannot say that the trial court had no basis or evidence in the record to support its decisions. So it's upholding the Rule 69 agreement in that context. I think it's really important here to... Where is, point to where is the valuation of that business in the record? Where can the court go and say, yep, it's worth $2 million? Where is that supported? Sure. It is on page... Uh, I believe it is page five of wife's motion. Although it is not clear in the Rule 69 agreement, the value assigned to the companies was approximately $2 million. And where did that come from? That came from the only evidence of that, right, because there was some horse trading involved, is going to be the party's own statement regarding what we agreed to, right? This isn't something where you can go Kelly Blue Book and figure out okay, that's probably the valuation. This is something that the parties, given that there were some concerns over these companies with um, investigations, et cetera, this is what we agreed to. She states it clearly on page five of her motion. Okay. But does the, the agreement doesn't say, we we parties agree this is worth two million and therefore wife gets one million. That is true. And the actual business evaluation that was conducted is in direct conflict with that valuation. I mean, it's off by over a million dollars. Well, Your Honor, I don't think that we know that because it wasn't submitted in the record. So I, I didn't put this in the papers because it wasn't in the record, but we don't know why the, the cost and valuation was not submitted as an attachment. I suspect that was because it was a draft and it was never finalized. Okay. So, so at the end of the day. We favor settlement. And in this case, the parties reached a settlement, and wife challenges it subsequently. Wouldn't it have been to everybody's benefit just to go to the evidentiary hearing and then I wouldn't be here? I couldn't agree more. I, I do think that um, that would have certainly been more efficient. Um, that being said, the threshold inquiry was not established here by creating an issue of fact. The the cost and valuation was not put or draft, whatever, was not put into the record in order for the court to even evaluate it. The court, I mean, I, I suppose, think about it this way. If she was to put in her motion that it was worth $100 million but sustained, provided no evidence of that whatsoever, just said it, right? The court's supposed to hold an evidentiary hearing on something that she just summarily declared? So would it be better if the court said, I see no evidence, I'm thinking of granting this, you better produce something to justify a hearing? under Rule 79 I think that that might be a, a sound policy decision going forward, but what Huckey requires doesn't require that here. And I think that Rule 79F, you know, is that is that possible that that could create, um, you know, some expediency in the future? It, it's possible. Um, that being said, in the Cooper decision, um, which wife attached to her notice of supplemental authority, in the footnote, it actually says, but nobody filed a summary judgment here. So Rule 79F doesn't have any application. I, uh, I assume you, you disagree with counsel's, your opposing counsel's assertion that 79F should control here. Right. I, I, do, I, I think it might this, be a good policy a, decision, but I don't think that it applies here whatsoever. And would you agree that the people who write the rules, the Supreme Court, if they want to implement similar procedures here, should put them in Rule 69, I would assume, right? Yes. So this really isn't a summary judgment proceeding. It, exactly. And I think that that, specifically for this the reason that the footnote in Cooper the said... parties entered into and a subsequent challenge to the fairness of that settlement agreement. Absolutely. I think your comments earlier about, you know, this is a, a 
different animal, right? Because it's almost analogous to like a settlement, you know, in the civil context that it's not, it's not conducive to summary judgment. And I also don't think that you need to, um, when, when a party doesn't sustain its initial burden of, of creating any fact issue, I'm not saying that, by the way, I want to make very clear, I'm not saying that wife needed to prove up every single element of, you know, um, of the unfairness, but she needed to submit some evidence to create an issue of fact. I mean, that is, you can't just declare something and then have it be gospel and then cry foul when you didn't get an evidentiary hearing on something well, that you never submitted. something in her motion, and you did not, here's where I now depart from you, is she asserted something in her motion, and I don't know why it wouldn't be incumbent upon you at that point to say, no, that's not true. At the end of the day, I mean, that's, that's the, kind of generally how we have motion practice is people assert something and someone says it's not true. And then the court can resolve it via hearing if there is a dispute. But as I read it, we really don't have a dispute that there was this independent evaluation out there. There is an independent evaluation, but the response that my client gave is arguing f that the two million valuation that the parties agreed to was fair. And there's no reason to depart from that because wife never said, I mean, there isn't a reason it's almost like, why would you argue with a ghost or something like that? You know what I mean? It's not, why, why engage in that practice when the because 2 million because the is sufficient? It's worth four or 3.4 to 4.08. And you were saying, well, we agreed to two. I, that's not really a disputing the fact that there's this other valuation out there. So that is true. But again, I return back to you have she needed to submit the evidence that this this it's evaluation. The there was an allegation that you guys were off by somewhere between seventy five or and one hundred percent on the valuation. But the parties both agreed to that, so there there is no. Right, and I go back to my Melinda Gates. If you agreed to Microsoft for two million, and it's then she files her thing and says six billion. I mean, at what point does that number become? Is Council it... isn't really the reason that we have the court do an independent assessment about whether or not a settlement agreement is equitable for that very reason, to ensure that somebody doesn't agree to something to their own detriment, not realizing that they're entitled to more? Well, that's that's a, that's a great question. Um, but I, again, I would return you to paragraph 31 of Hutkey. She had the exact same information as she did before. She had that cost and valuation report. This isn't something that got okay, you know, it's new evidence or anything like that. She had it before, she considered it, and she herself discounted it. Um, there, you're right that the court does have an, uh, um, a duty once it receives, um, you know, once it does find that it is unfair, right, it needs to, it needs to consider that. Um, but here, she had, it's the same, it's a subjective valuation, and I think that, going forward if you think about assets like this right that require some horse trading when you're when you're you know it isn't going to be um you know like i said kelly blue book or something like that where it's more obvious you know are you always going to allow every time someone agrees to a subjective valuation to then in a motion without citing any evidence challenge it well let's look at how could this have gone differently it could have gone differently if that $2 million valuation was reduced to writing in the settlement agreement, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> if we could rewind and start over in a different case, how do you see this going differently? What should we take away from what's happened here? Because we don't want people to appeal if they don't have to. We'd like them to get on with their lives. So how do we make this a simple process so everybody knows what they need to do? Sure. So I think that your decisions so far have actually made that quite clear that the assets themselves do need to be quantified in some way in the Rule 69 agreement. Here we have a unique scenario in which the wife stated, you know, the value is $2 million in her own motion. But so the agreement doesn't say that. That's true, but it doesn't need to say that. Right, because she agreed well, to just, it. You just said that parties should quantify the agreement. And right, that that that, but that isn't a a, a, um, a requirement for the agreement to be undone when she admits that it was two million. Right. So yeah, at the end of the day, that a little different than I do. I I read it as her saying, 
presumably because they gave me one million, we agreed to this two million. It doesn't ever say that the parties negotiated and, and arrived at a two million dollar valuation. The value assigned to the companies was approximately two million dollars. That that based to me, upon what? Based upon I assume the division of the of the property, her getting one million. No, that's that's not accurate. Um, she she it, it absolutely was two million, and I understand that now there's you know some well, revisionist the, the history going on, but the motion doesn't provide that level of detail that the parties negotiated and resolved it and d discounted it because of the risk of an ongoing operation. There's nothing in there that says that. Well, the, the, the paragraph right after the value assigned to the companies is approximately $2 million, is the valuation of COTS and valuation partners was apparently ignored or discounted at the mediation due to potential civil or criminal issues arising from respondents' operation of the companies in 2017 and 2018. I think it's reasonable to infer that we're talking about the two million, right? That was the number that was agreed to at the mediation, and she's explaining that it. The reason that um, she's challenging this now is is that the valuation itself was ignored. Thus, that's why we agreed to two million dollars. That's how she's explaining right, the problem is. Um, Are sick corrected? <laughs> it's okay. So I think uh, back to your point, Judge Campbell. How do we, you know, solve this going forward? I do think that your decisions do, in fact, especially Hutkey is, is directly on point here, um, requiring that the assets themselves be described, right, it, it, um, the value of them so that a, a reviewing court can consider that. That being said, um, here, in this case, when the court is, if the court were, you know, strictly just looking at the agreement, I think that might be a different scenario. But her motion affirmed the $2 million. The court considered that said, okay, that's clearly what they agreed to, and then was able to determine the fairness based on that. Um, so that in and of itself is sufficient. I believe I'm out of time, so thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, your honors. Um, there literally is no evidence that anybody subjectively agreed to a $2 million valuation ever. The lawyers who were in the case by the time these motions were filed weren't even the same lawyers uh, who were at the mediation. Um, well, respond to what she just read to us because I, it was something that I had either glossed over or missed or not read. But, but it does sound like in her own motion she acknowledges that there was a discount given for, for risks associated with the company. Yes, that's exactly what it says. It says apparently, because my co-counsel here wasn't there at the mediation, uh, ignored or discounted the hard valuation and and projecting from the one million that my client got they apparently agreed to this two million dollar valuation which is a completely unreasonable valuation is not supported by anything they didn't in fact the agree parties, I mean counsel and argument kind of brought up a point that I, I think I glossed over which is the fairness of it isn't just the fairness of the division it it could be the fairness of the valuation and if the parties agreed to evaluation and your own motion provided some basis upon which the court could look at it and say the overall valuation was fair why why should why does that trigger anything two things first of all even if the parties had in fact agreed and put it in the motion my client would still be entitled to come back to the judge and say wow that's a crazy valuation you should relook at that that's just not fair and there should be a hearing on that because it is in fact very different from the only real evidence that was in the record of valuation. And maybe we'll get into things like I was talking about a little bit ago about valuation date. Maybe it was worth more at the time of the petition filing and it's worth less, or maybe the other way around. There are, but at best, even if there were a $2 million agreement, uh, and that was not just a rhetorical device to show how unfair the, the, uh, the agreement was, because it was valuing the, the company at half value, uh, but even if there had been such an agreement, you still have to have a fairness agreement, a, a fairness hearing to say if that valuation and the subsequent division is fair. And you have to base it on actual evidence as to how in the world they got to such a low valuation. And, and I believe husband's going to be able to make his argument, and maybe that is his best trial strategy, to say, hey, I'm taking this risky company 
that that was essentially the argument he made he didn't say no there wasn't a four million dollar valuation he didn't he didn't really even say we agreed that there was a two million valuation at some point he said hey i'm taking a bunch of risky assets and therefore this unequal division is fine and i suppose he can make that there's not a ton of precedent to say that when you've got a hard valuation by a valuation person that they didn't already take that into account but he can make that argument maybe that is fair but there needs to be a hearing so I'm going to ask you the same question. How are we supposed to limit the challenges to settlement agreements? We prefer people to settle their cases. We prefer settlement agreements to be the end all be all. Parties can move on. How would you do this differently if you could do it over again? This was a very difficult case and a difficult mediation. Um, again, I think the critical point where you could make a difference is the point of saying, we just got to have a hearing to say whether this was fair or not. And maybe after a hearing, the judge would reach the same conclusion. Maybe, uh, maybe they wouldn't. I kind of don't think they would, because it is a really big difference. But if the judge would just say, I'm not convinced you need to show me some evidence, that would have been a lot more straightforward. And probably the judge would have made the correct decision, said, OK, you're right. There is a kind of a, a, a big difference here. Um, that's the point where you could critically intervene and make the thing come out differently. I don't know that the parties were going to agree. I suspect that the wife wouldn't even have agreed to the to the uh, agreement if it had said the companies are only worth two million. She would have said, "You're nuts. That's that's not what they're worth." But that's speculation. Just like everything else we know about the basis for this agreement. So drafting of the agreements by the attorneys representing clients is really where this could have been averted? I don't know. Honestly, if, if the agreement said the, the parties agree this is worth $2 million, my client would still be entitled to come back into court and say, no, that's crazy. I, I did that. I was out of my mind, and it's unfair. And you, judge, should look at it, because it's just obviously unfair, even if that were what happened. And I don't think it is what happened. Time goes quickly. It does despite indeed. Despite your prediction. <laughs> Council, thank you both for your arguments. You've given us much to think about. We'll take the matter under advisement and issue a written ruling in due course. And we are in recess.